right, guys. Uh, welcome to another episode of a Dead Hedgehogs podcast. Uh, tonight it is me, Stephen Kelly. We have Chris Sledgehammer, Gav Gavigan. We have Peter French Tosto Tool, and we have the Irish legend Tom the Tank Egan, who is born in Ireland but now living in Boston, which is home from home in America, uh, as well. I know myself. Tom, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank, thanks for thank coming you so on, much. Tom. Good of me and Thanks for coming on, Tom. Thanks a million. Appreciate it. Yeah, yeah no, my pleasure. Yeah. Uh, Tom, we, we, we were actually chatting here before we started the podcast, and we, we just got into like a, a brilliant conversation, and I, and I want to get back into it again. You're, you're out in America, and you're in Boston, probably one of the, the, the most Irish cities in, in, in America, from my experience anyway, and from what I know. Um, how, how has it been out there for you? I have to say, like, the city of Boston has treated me very, very well. Like, I'm very, very lucky, you know, since I've come out here, um, you know, just uh, the, uh, taken, they've taken a real liking to me. Uh, I mean, it's no surprise, again, given that I'm Irish. And this, this city is very, very densely Irish, you know, throughout the years. Um, you know, you go into the, the, the policing, the politics, uh, you know, even, even the mobsters. <laughs> it's all That's Irish right. top to bottom. It's been Irish top to bottom. Yeah, yeah, it's been Irish top to bottom. So, uh, and you drive around many of the um, many of the neighborhoods, and you'll see, you know, uh, a whole mix of Irish flags and American flags, and it's really, really cool. But no, Boston's been great to me. I love this city. Like, I was just walking the dog there, and now we're walking around, um, and like, just, just the the history in this city is incredible. You know, we're talking, we talked earlier on before the recording about that it's Patriots Day today. Um, and it's, or, or in Boston, as, as I was telling you, we know it is Marathon Monday as well. We obviously don't have it on today because of the COVID, but uh, usually we have a big, you know, the Boston Marathon, which is a huge national spectacle that we have here every year. But, um, but the significance of Patriots Day is obviously the battles of Lexington and Concord were fought on this day in 1775. And that kickstarted the American Revolution, which went up till 1783. And then obviously America gained its independence from Britain. But, uh, I'm walking around with the dog and I'm looking over and, and I have a spect I'm in East Boston, which is actually where the Irish would have, a lot of the Irish, particularly during the famine times, would have arrived here um, in this area first. There's a church down the street called the Holy Redeemer, which is now predominantly South American. And like, I'll go to mass there every now and again, and I'll just, the mass will be all in Spanish and it's brilliant. And like, they're, 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 um, they're kind of, uh, uh, you know, you know, when you have a break in mass, they'll play music or they'll play mm -hmm. like, you know, and in, in Irish mass, it's real like kind of, they try and make it very like, um, you know, spiritual music, you know, but in, in, with the, with the uh, Spanish mass, it's like, they'll be playing salsa in between. Yeah. You're sitting there, you're sitting there going, Jesus, fucking, this is some good crack right now, you know? <laughs> <laughs> But that church, that church was originally Irish. Um, it was built by the Irish uh, way back when. And what's really cool about East Boston, you know, this used to actually used to be hunting grounds for the Native Americans. Um, this particular area, because you have a lot. This, 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 this. It's almost like a little island, the way it's broken up, but attaches more to the mainland. Uh, but go, from here all the way up towards Revere, which is obviously named after Paul Revere, who known for riding the horse signaling that the British are coming and whatnot. But uh, well, from here all the way to Revere, this would have been very like, you know, grasslands, marshy grasslands, a lot of deer, a lot of, a lot of wildlife would have been around here. So this was hunting grounds originally. And then it just so happened that, uh, like I can look out my window right now. I'm, I'm looking, I'm, I'm in a tall building. So I look out and you see all the lands broken up. So this is where ships would have come in right here. And this would have been one of the closer points for them to land. So, uh, East Boston was a home for a lot of immigrants initially, but the Irish would have landed here first and then they would have gone, you know, to the likes of Dorchester and South Boston. I did the opposite. I went to Southie first, then Dorchester, and now I landed in East Boston. So, but uh, yeah, I lived I lived in Dorchester for for many months uh, back about oh, 15 years ago now, if not a bit more. Yeah, so it was a great spot. But, but going back to what I was saying about Patriots Day, I'm walking around and it's like you're looking out and you just see just all the history around here is incredible. You know, you had the Boston Tea Party, which is which happened right across the water right here. And sometimes every now and again, you'll see people on the Bay Area there when the tide goes out, they'll be collecting glass or old bottles. And like some of these glasses or bottles date back to like the 1700s. It's mad because 
people forget that, that happened right there, you know. But um, mm-hmm. but yeah, no, Boston's treated me great. I love Boston. I do love the city, and um, you know, thank God, you know, we're starting to get back to some normality now. People are out playing, and well, they have been. You know, Boston, we're kind of 50-50 with this COVID thing. You got people who are pushing. People were pushing for the likes of the lockdowns, uh, which to me is just. I I mean, I'm not trying to push my views on anybody, but to me, at least living here in Boston, I was just like, that didn't make any sense. And then you've got a lot of people who are like, all right, we'll do the mask thing. We'll do the social distancing. Just let us fucking get back to normal a little bit, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the last few months has been very good. I have to say people are getting back. And uh, But then there's a lot of other states in, in the U.S. now that are that have lifted all their mandates and their cases have plummeted. And then it's making it's making states like Massachusetts or New York or these other states that are keeping their lockdowns, making them look stupid. Because nobody has an explanation as to why these cases keep plummeting, like to Texas, in the Dakotas, and Mississippi, after they lifted their mandate. So, um, you know, that, that's 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 interesting. It's great to get to get a a like on the ground account of what's going on instead of listening to the media and whatnot. It's great to get, yeah, get someone. Yeah, I mean, out. like that's a, that's an absolute fact. And actually, they had Dr. Fauci on MSNBC there as last week. And they said to him, they said, you know, he was trying to be like, oh, well, even if you're vaccinated, you still have to wear the mask. And they were like, well, why is that? And he goes, oh, well, you could still uh, infect people. And they were just like, well, what's the point then? Or like, and he's like, well, you might not get sick, but you might, uh, you know, infect somebody else. And they were like, well, then if you have it, can you, that, you're, so you're saying you can have it even though you're vaccinated. And he was kind of dancing around it. And then they said to them, they said, well, what about Texas and what about Florida? Like you guys basically said that after the Super Bowl, when they were all celebrating afterwards down there, massive parties down there, you guys were all saying, and all the media was saying, Florida's going to have a big spike and people are going to be dying and it'll be awful. And that just never happened. And he was like, oh, well, you know, there's a lag in data. And then they basically said, well, what about Texas? What about this place? What about that place? They're all going down, but you guys keep saying wear a mask. And he was like, well... I don't know, to be honest. You, you see, like, that, that, that's a lot of the problem, and it's the same here as well. They make these statements, and then when they're questioned on them, it's it's it, they don't have a comeback for it, and that that yeah. leads to people not l- losing confidence. Now, obviously, there's there's a virus going around, but if 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 the lockdown, I think, is 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 the wrong way to go. If if you've been following any of my the videos that I do put up, I'm I'm not. I'm not one of these anti-vaxxers, but I'm definitely anti, anti-lockdown. I just don't understand. Well, I, you know, I, I, think, I think the problem is with everything that's going on, we're, we're being robbed of the choice. And I think that's the biggest problem is, is, is you know, it's so funny. Like, I mean, it's no surprise I was a big Trump guy, uh, you know, I'm a big Trump guy. But, you know, like he was the only world leader at the time that was basically saying, hey, you know, followed the criteria in the beginning. And then as more evidence started to come out, we got to know this thing better, started saying, well, maybe it's better. He kept saying, we can't make the cure worse than the problem. And I didn't know what he meant initially by that when he kept saying it. I was like, what does he mean by that? And what he meant by it was, we can't make the cure, meaning we can't do things like the lockdowns, like this, like that, robbing people of their livelihoods, watching mental health and suicides and and all these other health problems spiral out of control as a result of just trying to stop this one thing and i thought and that's something that i mean you know i mean it's obviously there was major massive now we know i mean it's pretty evident there was massive major force that was just completely against him and and they worked tirelessly 24 hours to be against him so you never once heard people actually grasp some of the things that he was saying but um i just think we were robbed of it we're robbed of a choice uh, you know, and I, I make this argument to people, if you if you had two restaurants, right, right across the street from each other, and the government never got involved, and the government basically just said, hey, there's a virus going around, it's a pandemic, we're going to allow people to make their own choices and handle it the way they want to handle it. These are the guidelines, if you want to be careful, these are the guidelines that we recommend you follow, and if you don't want to be careful, well, that's on you. I guarantee you that if you had restaurants right across the street from each other, you had one bar restaurant that had all the restrictions in the world, Social distancing, masks, you can't. You have to wear your mask to and from the bathroom. You have to wear it going in, going out. You, you know, you can only have six to a table, no standing at the bar, all this bollocks. And then across the street, you had a, a bar that had no restrictions at all. Fucking get everybody in there as much as you want, back to normality. I guarantee you in the beginning of this thing, 
people would have been trying to go to that one bar because they didn't know too much about it. And then sooner than later, once they realize that that's a pain in the ass, the bar with no restrictions would be packed. Yeah. I don't think it would even take that long. They've got a massive homeless epidemic. <laughs> There's homeless people in here right now that are like, they've got bigger concerns than fucking COVID. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not all dead in the streets. You know, and that to me, that to me is big. And then why are they allowing, why is it okay for all these protests to have happened? Like people packed like sardines on the streets, but you can't go to a fucking funeral for somebody who you love, you know? That yeah. doesn't make any sense. So I think that's when, a big when, one. When they start doing all these little things, it starts to make you say, well, this is purely political now. This is purely political, you know, because you're not giving us a choice. And then you're, you guys are cherry picking what you want us to do or how you want us to follow it. And I don't think it's 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 not ignorant and it's not selfish to want to question those things. The way it's being put out there, like people are like, "Oh, well, you're being selfish uh, by not wanting to wear a mask and wanting to get back to normal life." What about me? Well, it's like, what exactly is selfish? Like, you know, understanding that people should be responsible for their own health and their own concerns for themselves. That's 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 not being selfish, but demanding demanding that other people, you know, have to comply uh, to these unreasonable um you know and and let's say let's put it quite simply harsh lockdowns and rules and robbing people of their livelihoods that's actually selfish you know what i'm saying like me having to comply to cater to your fear is selfish not me wanting to just get back on my normal life you know it's a funny yeah. one because um it's relatively new so they don't really know. So it came out first, they were saying the masks didn't work, the WHO. And then they came out and said, no, we need the masks. And in Ireland, they particularly came out and said the masks didn't work and they followed the guidelines from the WHO. And I think one of the reasons was because they didn't they didn't have a surplus of masks for healthcare workers. Do you know what I mean? So they didn't want the healthcare workers not having masks and the general mm. public having masks. And so I think it's in its infancy. Do you know what I mean? It's kind of like, I hear what you're saying. It's freedom of... Um, expression and freedom of will but i think it's a funny one it's hard to know because there's misinformation do you know what i mean and i but agree that but the, i agree that the that. lockdowns the lockdowns aren't really working that much um yeah. but it's kind of like if everybody had aids and we weren't wearing johnny's no. <laughs> a lot of people would well, nobody AIDS. does anyways nobody wears johnny's anyways and there's AIDS, have AIDS every year, you know you know, like it's fucking, it's mad. But the thing is, like, I, I know exactly what you're saying, but but there is significant amount of evidence now a year into this. And we know who it affects. We know who it kills. Um, but we also know that it's been extremely politicized. We know that it's being leveraged for to gain power. We know that the, that the, that the COVID was leveraged and used to um, get more people to vote in the 2020 election. I mean, that's not even a debate. That, that's a true fact. They now, they had, the biggest turnout they ever had uh, for the 2020 election ever. I mean, an incumbent uh, uh, president had more votes than any president in the United States history, 75, 80 million votes. And then obviously Biden, you know, supposedly got his 80 million or 82 million votes. But I'm, what I'm saying is without COVID, without the mail, mass mail-in voting, without, without all that stuff, the 2020 election would have been very vastly different because you would have had people who would have taken the time to actually go to the polling booths, to actually get out and vote, who care enough about it. I mean, for crying out loud, you got people here who voted in the 2020 election just because it was, it was, it was the thing to do. You know, there's nothing else going on. That was the whole thing. And then the same fuckers who were voting for you to stay at home, voting for the lockdowns, the second they announced that Biden won, they were like out in the droves in the streets and no one was stopping them. But you and I couldn't go, you and I couldn't have a picnic in the fucking park. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so like, it's just, an, it's just an absolute joke. I think the way it's, it was leveraged, it, it, it's just, when you look at the evidence and, and, and you look, even look at the scientific evidence, like, like it doesn't affect kids, but yet we don't have kids in schools. Um, and it doesn't affect, uh, you know, young, healthy people. It obviously affects people who are older, people who are immune, have, uh, you know, deficient immune systems and um compromised immune systems and um you know so i think when you when you when you look at the 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 evidence and what we have and the way it's being presented it's like a lot of the things don't make sense but at the same time when you look at things like how it's being leveraged for power to gain control over certain things you have to question and you have to say well hold on a second this is a bit funky and the problem is why is it that when we question it 
it gets censored, it gets taken down. You know, more voices, more opinions, more people talking and discussing is how science uh, is supposed to work, how people are supposed to come to certain conclusions, not just blocking and censoring people, you know? It's just bizarre. Yeah. Like, America probably the shows that it's more politicized in America than other countries. Other countries have almost had this unifying force about behind it. Right, with, because with most countries, things. most countries are of one group of people. And also, too, you gotta remember the likes of Ireland and the UK, our main news channels are all government funded. RT yeah. is government funded, BBC yeah. is government funded. Yeah. So you're just getting one news yeah. source and you're getting this kind of one single Narrative. mindset then behind the country versus in America with our freedom of the press and, and all that kind of stuff. You have private entities competing. Uh, and like people will say, oh, well, America's politics and views and opinions are very polarizing. Well, that's because you can have competing mindsets. You know, the whole goal is like, let's hear, let's weigh out the arguments and, and logically determine weighing out the evidence, weighing out what makes sense. Let's go with that. The problem is with Facebook, Twitter, and everything like that, you've got all these major conglomerates who are siding with one, one particular set of ideologies, and one set of views. They're censoring all the opposing views. So that's, that's not healthy. And, and when you don't necessarily get a lot, of, a lot of what we have in America, these competing views in other countries, because again, they tend to be one group of people, like in Ireland, pretty much everyone's Irish, Irish Catholic for the most part. And then you have government funded news channels, which just give you one, one uh, idea or one perspective versus over here, you've got a choice. Well, just two examples. I can turn on Fox News and get a more conservative uh, viewpoint, or I can turn, C turn on CNN get a more liberal perspective and you can weigh it out yourself. You also have a lot of uh, competing private journalists here, or, or sorry, um, uh, um, uh, independent journalists here who have a voice and they'll throw their voices around. And like, and the whole idea is that we should use these arguments and these voices to, to get to um, a point where we can say, okay, what, what's the most logic here? So I, again, I understand but the like, point. But the, just to, just to, on the, the, the way you say, you know, obviously, you're choosing the facts you like then. Yeah, I, I'm, well, I know it's not perfect. It's definitely not perfect when yeah. RT are telling you this is what it is. And it might, we, we, can't, we don't have a counterpoint, right? That, that's not far from perfect. But having a, a very swayed argument to, to, a, to, a, to your audience, because like, let's put it this way, Fox News is there to sell. And they're there to sell conservative ideas and ideals. Well, every, every news station is whether exactly. they're liberal or conservative. Yeah. So and and CNN doing the same. So they're actually not. They're not. One of them is skewing the truth one way. One might be skewing truth the other way. And you're but right. I, I think you that, should take a, take a balanced approach. But like exactly, balanced approach. people actually aren't like that. They actually like the news they like. So they'll end right. up going into this fucking echo chamber of what they like. I'd say the rest is bullshit even though right. there might be truth there as well. Right, and, and that's a fair point. However, when you allow that to happen, you, 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 you come to the conclusion, well, what makes more sense? Forcing people against their will to lock down and robbing them of their livelihoods, businesses being closed, people going bankrupt, people dying, killing themselves yeah, yeah. because they're depressed. I, I agree, or, I agree with that. That's or, it's shocking. Or, or you say, all right, well, if we all can't come to an agreement on what to do here, I think logically, if we all can't come to an agreement, if you've got one set of people, like you said, to your point, one set of people are like, I choose these, these, um, uh, you know, these set of, uh, uh, this set of information to lead me to my uh, conclusions. And the other set says, well, I had these to lead me to my conclusions. The idea behind that argument should weigh it out and say, well, I think the only logical explanation here is that you people do what you want to do and you people do what you want to do. That's not yeah. what we're seeing though. We're seeing one, narrative dominate everything else without without the a competing uh voice uh, because that competitive voice is being censored and i saw i saw a very good uh, tweet one time and it was nobody in history who censored other people were ever the good guys think about that for a second you know you look at world war ii and everyone brings up world war ii the nazis it gets thrown around fascism all that bullshit but you look at the uh, even throughout history People who censor other people are typically not the good guys. Um, mm -hmm. You know, when the when, when America was founded and uh, the first uh, presidential election was happening uh, between John Adams and uh, 
John Adams was the was the incumbent president at the time. Uh, he was Washington's. Uh, and John Adams is from Brain from Quincy, which is right here. Well, Braintree it was Braintree, and now it's Quincy, right here, two towns over. He's buried right there. His son, uh, who's uh, seventh president of the United States, John Adam, John Quincy Adams, he's there. They're buried right there. And during that first presidential uh, race, you had on the other side, you had Thomas Jefferson, you had a couple of other guys competing, and. Thomas Jefferson and John Adams were like founding fathers. They they had written the Declaration of Independence together. They had drafted the Constitution together and all this great stuff. But when it came down to competing to who was going to be president, it was a dirty fight. It was a dirty fight. And, you know, people had to have all these informations weighed on them and everything like that. And Abigail Adams at the time, she, she was in, in fuming because her husband, John Adams, who was president of the United States, she was quoted in saying that if this was if this was in England, they'd be hung, you know, because in England, obviously, you couldn't talk shit about the king or whatever like that. Mm-hmm. But, um, but they founded that document, freedom of the press, freedom of speech, all the kind of stuff, because they they knew they knew that okay, we're eventually going to run into certain things with this, but it's better to allow people to have a voice than to not have a voice. Do you get me? Yeah, uh, I, uh, the, I uh, 100% agree with you, Tom, but let me play devil's advocate for a minute. I'm not a big Trump man myself, so uh, but then I respect your opinion and your views and yeah. more power to you. Do you know what I mean? Like Steve's dad now, he's a big Trump man and we'd have serious debates in his house, but they're healthy debates and that's a good thing, you know? Yeah. But um, let me put this, this to you now, right? It's an ex- they don't know much about the virus. They don't know the long-term effects of the virus. So th- people have been equating it to the Blitz, the Blitz in World War II when they were trying to bomb Britain and Ireland. And they were saying, everybody do their part. Turn off your lights so the Germans can't see where to bomb, basically. Do you know what I mean? Or yeah, well, that's because, that's because if a fucking bomb it's, 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 can it's, actually kill you. No, no, but let, let, let me finish. <laughs> let me finish. Let me finish. So people, people that are pro the masks and pro the thing are saying it's not a question of free will when it's a question if it's a global pandemic everybody can infect everybody that's their argument i'm not saying it's my argument but i'm saying it's kind of like not having seat belts in cars do you know what i mean and everybody going around not wearing seat belts i know well, you could I say I, I don't wear a seat belt and i haven't died and haven't killed anybody i'm a responsible driver but i don't wear a seat belt because you know you don't really have to hear it's it's considered a secondary offense if you're speeding and you get pulled over and you're not wearing a seat belt you can get a ticket for that, but a cop won't pull you over for not wearing a seatbelt, unlike in Ireland, obviously. But, but again, to your point, <clears throat> bombs can actually kill you. You know, yeah. COVID's not going to kill me. You know, it's not going to kill me. And you know what? I haven't killed anybody's grandmother yet. You know what I mean? Oh, and, okay, and I'm not okay, trying, I'm not trying let's, to be, I'm not trying let's, to be condescending to your way. point. Let me put another way. Let oh, me wait, put another I'm, way. Not being, I'm not being condescending to your point. I'm just simply saying that we ha- it's a year... There's enough evidence. We know who this affects. We know who it harms. You know, bombs harm every, harm everybody. And I get that. Like, if you're, it's a, a, when you're in a wartime effort, you do need people to to pick up. And nobody's better at picking up and getting things going than than America when it comes to a wartime. Um, I mean, this, you know, you look at World War II and all the all the all the weapons for World War II were built in Watertown here, not far from here. A lot, well, a lot of them were a lot of a lot of ammo and stuff, and bombs and stuff, but. You know, when it comes to a virus like this, when it comes to your health, you know, th- there is there is significant amount of evidence now to, to, for us to know what works and what doesn't work. You know what I'm saying? But go ahead. What was your other point? My my other point was saying maybe the bomb one was a bad uh, metaphor. But I was going to say it's kind of like drink driving, okay? People can go out and have 20 drinks and drive. Uh, that's not very responsible. So I'm saying, like, they've made these rules for a reason. If people wear masks, if well, they if they work, we follow the science and give it a chance. Right. I mean. but, but here's the thing: like, like I'm, I, I agree with you with the lockdown. I agree with you with the lockdown. I don't think it's good for people's mental health or businesses yeah. or general kids' social interaction. There's kids growing up now, and they're like nine and ten. How are they going to interact with other kids when they're mm. just on screens and locked down? It was bad enough on screens. You know what I mean? Yeah. But um. That's that's all I wanted to say. I just yeah, wanted to get well, that like, in. You know, again, like with, with drink driving, like you may or you may not kill somebody when you drive home. You may or you may not kill somebody, depending on how how much control you're in. You may or may not kill somebody. Seatbelts thing, you may or you may not die, depending on what happens. Um, but the thing about the mask uh, and, and and all that stuff is, it's just like 
you are not you are not gonna die of covid unless you have certain health ailments you got certain uh you know comorbidities you got certain problems with your health or you're you're very very old or you're overweight and we know that and and maybe there's a, a an absolute you know small small percentage of young healthy people that might get it that might have a hard time with it but likewise the flu is the exact same i mean i remember when this first thing kicked off in march between the, the CDC numbers here, which is the Center for Disease Control here in America, who are like the main governing uh, body for like numbers of deaths and diseases and whatnot. Their numbers show that from November to March, from November 2019 to March 2020, like something crazy, like 55 or 60,000 people had died from the flu. And like, that's just, that's just in the space of what, November, December, January, February, March, that's five months. And that wasn't considered an epidemic or a pandemic or anything like that. And there's flu shots and it's constantly morphing, it's constantly changing. And I just think we need to get to the understanding that I think we're just going to have to live with this uh, COVID thing. It's never going away. It's all, we're always going to get new variants. It's always going to mutate itself. But it's, all, it's always going to kill the same amount of people over and over again. And I just yeah. don't think it's worth, I just, I just don't think it's worth robbing people of their livelihoods and their choices and their individual liberties and, you know, just being able to get on with things. Uh, because then you just turn into a police state. I mean, look at Canada right now, for crying out loud. They're sending their best police out on the streets to forcibly lock people down. I mean, if that's not so-called fascism, I don't know what is, you know, over a fucking flu, basically. <laughs> you know what I mean? You see, the, the, the thing is, it's, it's, this is just going to substitute the flu. And obviously, we have to protect the vulnerable. I mean, but that, but that would be the same case in any disease or, or any virus. Obviously, the, 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 the vulnerable have well, to be I, I, I honestly think it's a lot harder than the flu. Like, yeah. I really do. Well, it's it's, like, it's it, not the same as the flu. I know, I know people compare it to the flu in certain places, but it's not the same as the flu. Like, there's, well, put it this, way, six, put it this way. Just, I'm going to play devil, devil, devil's advocate to your argument there now. Okay. Uh, have, you, have you ever heard of somebody having the flu and not knowing that they had it? Yeah, 100%. No, you, 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 if you have the flu, you know you have it, right? You're like, fuck, I have the flu. But you, but this you, is one you of might those... have the flu and you might pass it to someone else and someone else might get sick because of you. It might yeah, not affect exactly. you at all. Exactly. Yeah. Well, we, well, we don't know that. Well, we don't know. But COVID, we know. Well, I don't know. Maybe we need a doctor on here to explain it to us. But I've never heard of somebody having the flu and not knowing that they had it versus I, I could have COVID right now and I don't even know I have it. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but the argument, the argument they keep coming up with to move the goalposts, oh, you could give it to somebody else, you could give it to somebody else. Well, should James like give anything to anybody then at that point? Like, how the fuck, like, it, it, it's just, it doesn't make any sense, in my opinion, at least. It, like, for me, just, you're, you're essentially accusing everybody of being, of doing something wrong. And, and, you know, when you look at, like, you know, we talk about, like, due process of the law, for crying out loud, in, in a court of law, you can't just make everybody uh, a suspect or, or uh, a perpetrator of a crime that they don't even know that they're committing. That's essentially what we're being labeled. Like we're being labeled as people, if me walking around without my mask on, perfectly healthy, perfectly normal, I'm being looked as a perpetrator. That's wrong. I mean, in what society ever, uh, well, in what society in, in modern day times is something like that okay, where people are being labeled perpetrators for things they don't even know what they're doing. And that's that's unfortunate what's happening with our society. There's a book that I'm reading, well, it's not really a book, it's a long essay. I recommend you guys read it. It's by a guy named John Stuart Mill. He's actually a British uh, British guy, he's a philosopher and and, uh, and his father was as well. But he has, a, he has a, a long essay called On Liberty. And basically what he talks about in the book, he, he discusses government tyranny versus social tyranny. And he talks about, you know, how America and how, you know, obviously in England at the time, is it was published in the 1800s, man, 1850 something. And he's talking about social tyranny, meaning how customs and, 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 and how like the society can be tyrannical towards the individual and there's no rules or boundaries to stop it. And we see that now with the, I'm reading it. I'm like, holy shit, this is now, this is like, this is, we're seeing this with the social tyranny of the mass of like shaming people into locking down and, yeah, and then and then and it's it's tied in with this racial stuff as well. Like you, you're being tied in with like, you know, uh, you, you don't you don't fucking do the BLM shit. You're a racist. You know what I mean? Like it, this social tyranny is is unfolding before our eyes, and um, just labeling people perpetrators, labeling people perpetrators, uh, 
for something that they may not even know that they're doing or they're not doing at all is just not a healthy step uh, for society, in my opinion. In in Boston, in Boston, I, I heard that there was the restrictions are, are starting to lift. Correct. Like yeah, they have been. They have been. Yeah, slowly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They have it's been, just. Yeah. It's just. I don't know. I just. I yearn for to get things back to the way to to the way it was, and I do think that. The, and I've said this in a, on a lot of podcasts that we've done. I think that the fallout from the lockdowns um, will be greater than the actual disease itself. I think mm. in, 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 in the like long that, term. That's, that's all well and good when you haven't had someone that's died from coronavirus, Stephen. Going, yeah. oh, it's it, like you, you, and this is, and this is going back to an argument that it's all fucking well and good whinging about the lockdowns and fucking complain about all the problems from the lockdowns which is which are real there are people that are going through some serious depression i'm not i'm not fucking saying that they're not and the people that are under serious financial restraint luckily in ireland they they have to a certain extent offset some of the financial problems people are having with like the likes of the pup payment which America didn't really do to to a large degree because it's obviously such a large country, but like that's all people. Yeah, and also also drop all that also, to have Ireland, their fucking Ireland. loved one back. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah of course, so, of course. Yeah, like, but here's the thing though, like, like, okay, you, you talk about that argument. Oh well, it's all fun and games until you've lost somebody from COVID. Well, it's all fun and games until you've lost somebody to suicide or depression. I, I know, you I know. know. There's no, oh, there's, oh, right, oh, there's no oh, good oh, oh, answer oh, oh, there. But like the or, or addiction or you know people get addicted to alcohol people got addicted i mean i had my first panic attack uh i've ever had in my whole life last summer because uh, well sorry before last summer because we went into lockdown and i was like ah, oh, geez uh you know i all of a sudden like no fights no nothing you know the gym's not open i'm like all right well geez i may as well just fucking have a scoop then <laughs> or i was having <laughs> whiskey and, and that just became like a daily thing now not that i was like all right, trying to pile down the alcohol or anything that, but I was just bored. So I would like, all right, I'm sitting down, you're watching your fucking Tiger King or you're, <laughs> or you're watching whatever and you're cracking open a whiskey and then the next day and you're like, oh, let me I'll have this cigar, have this. And next thing you know, like a month or two into it, um, you know, just, I just noticed like, I, I all of a sudden one day my, my heart, my chest got real tight. And I was like, holy shit, what the fuck's going on? I thought I was having a heart attack. And I later found out that I was having, I had like an anxiety attack. And that was as a result of me basically just being inactive, uh, drinking, not eating right, just being, oh, well, nothing's going on, this, that, and the other. Now, yeah. my fault. But can you imagine now I work at a gym? I had the option of being able to say, all right, I'm an athlete. I know how to stop this. Use your head time. Stop drinking. Eat, get on track with your food. Get in the gym. Do, do a little something every day. And I was able to prevent myself from having any more of those. But in the moment, it was very, very serious. And I said to myself, holy shit, if I'm feeling like this, a young, healthy, ath athletic, you know, individual who knows how to look after themselves, what are other people feeling like? You know what I mean? How are other people going to get control of that? And that, to me, is, is a very serious thing. And no one's talking about it. Everyone's just talking about... Oh, and I oh, agree. May, and people you may, were... Everyone's talking about you may or may not have somebody that will die from COVID. Like, like people were suffering... And I agree that that like that and that's this is definitely not like I think that anyone that goes through any anxiety attack, as we all probably have at some stage or another, mm. like or 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 might or might develop one day, that it's serious and you have to mm. be able to. It's mostly a compartmentalization thing, and there's mm -hmm. lots of therapeutic like mental therapeutic stuff yep. to be able to know when stuff like that's going on. But people were also suffering like that before the COVID. It's exasperated by COVID. And oh, it's exasperated. It's, it's like, Enormous. yeah, it's exasperated big time. It's, yeah, it's, but I, 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 I there's think, no, there's I think no easy, oh, no easy answer to any of these things. And I can understand why some of these um, governments have gone with a safety first approach. Which, yeah. right or wrong, well, I, that's where I, we're at in Ireland at the moment. I think, I think we're I think, I, I think I think we're digging the same trench here. We're going around in circles. Yeah. <laughs> right. I was just about to say. What is the solution? Just to finish off the oh, point go, that I was going to make there about 
about, you know, that, you know, it's all fun and games until you lose somebody to COVID. But, you know, you can say that about anything about like, you know, it's all, you know, do you want to drive with your seatbelt or without your seatbelt and then you lose somebody? Does that make you going to wear your seatbelt? Like, or, or do you not drive at all? You know, or, or like fucking, you have, you know, somebody that died of AIDS. Do you not, do you not, do you never do it raw again? <laughs> You know what I mean? <laughs> you never have sex again. You know, and, and again, I'm not trying to make fun. I'm not trying to make fun of it. I'm just, like, I guess, what I'm trying to say is like, I just think the important thing when it comes to the argument of, you may or may not have somebody that'll die. I, I just think it's important to realize. Well, you know, we just know now. Like we know that not everyone's gonna die of it, and and that's just how life is. Like not everyone's gonna die of everything. You know, I could die. I could die from getting hit by a car. I, I you think could die from something, and you know, you never know. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. You could all die from different things. No, no, I, and I, I, I agree. I know, but I know, I know what you're saying. Um, I, I think I agree too, Tom. But I think the frustrating thing, I just could come from an Irish perspective, is I can't speak for America. All we know is the news, and we know the news is full of shit. But um, uh, all I could say from an Irish perspective was, okay, guys, lockdown. We don't want the ICUs, the intensive care units, getting overran. We locked down. We were good. We locked down. And then they gave us money to be uh, to lock down. And we're like, oh, happy days. We're locking down. For some people, some people, that wasn't good because they're the business, bar owners, publicans, you know what I mean? Uh, restaurants that didn't work. So they locked down. They got the Games. things. They got the ICU numbers down. Then we opened up. And then all of a sudden, they came up again. And now we're locked down again. And now we're up again. I think what was frustrating in an Irish perspective was they kept changing the goalposts. Do you oh, know what I mean? The goalposts oh, well, kept they've, they've done that every year. They've done that. They've done that. Or sorry, they've done that everywhere. The goalpost thing, and even here, here in uh, here in Boston, you know, most hospitals run at. And this is not me. I heard this from a a, a person who works at a hospital who's a specialist and all that kind of stuff. There was they were explaining to me at least here in America, most hospitals operate at ninety five percent capacity. That five percent is obviously reserved for what if an emergency or a disaster or a natural disaster happens or something like the Boston bombing. OK, that happened here in 2013, I believe uh, I remember. Yes, 2013. Yeah, uh, they, that five percent is for the things like that emergencies. Right. But I mean, during COVID, most hospitals were at like 60 percent capacity because no one's showing up for the doctor's appointments. Elective surgeries got canceled. All these other things went out the window. No one's sitting there waiting to get their, uh, you same, know, same thing happened here. no one's getting this. No one's getting that. So the hospital's we're not overrun and they ha like and i was in the hospitals my i have a buddy of mine who underwent certain surgeries god bless him he's fine now i had a buddy of mine who had two very serious surgeries uh, heart surgeries and one of them was before covid and one of them was during covid and i was in the hospitals both times pre-covid was more busy post-covid it wasn't so busy oh sorry say so pre-covid and during covid during covid it wasn't so busy and they built, they had like, when Trump had the, uh, the Army Corps of Engineers build up field hospitals in the Javits Center in New York, even here in the, um, in the Heinz Convention Center here in Boston to, to prepare for this like massive, like, you know, people just dropping dead, needing ventilators, all this kind of stuff. He sent out the big army uh, medical ships out to California and New York as well. Not one patient, not one patient was put in those field hospitals. And the hospital still ran at sixty percent capacity. So this whole concept of fifteen days to slow the spread, or to slow the whatever, when you look at the numbers, there just simply wasn't anything that they said was going to happen. There was no massive influx of people being poured into the hospital. And in some of these hospitals, they were only using maybe two floors for COVID people, so they were jamming everybody on these two floors. So nurses and doctors who were working there, hospital administrators were saying, "We'll shut down these other parts of the hospital." go down these go into these two certain floors to do covid we'll call them the covid wards and all these people are being lumped in there now you you go to work and you're a covid nurse so you might think the world's ending because you're on those two floors you know what i mean when really the rest of the hospital is uh is is partially vacant just because no one wants to go in there elective surgeries were cancelled all this stuff was done so if it, it, that's the other thing like that's another i feel like it was another lie that was told to us about yeah, I think it was crazy influx of people that were just going to be dropping dead. And, and it was this serious thing. Like, you're sitting there in March, April going, holy shit, man. Like, this is scary. And now you're saying, fuck. I'm like, what was that all about? You know what I mean? Yeah. It's, uh, it's, yeah, it's a funny one. There, there's no easy answers to any of this. And, like, is that... And what's scary, no what's scary, go back to the... the, 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 the What's the one? Politicalization or whatever. Political, politicalization. <laughs> 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 Go back to how it was 
going back to how I feel like it was politicized, you have the, the governor of New York, Andrew Cuomo, right? He was being renowned and revered as this great governor that was doing everything right because he could talk and all this kind of stuff. Well, as it turns out, he made an order that got covered up, that they lied about it to uh, the Department of Justice. They covered up all the numbers, all the evidence. And it only ended up coming out because one of his closest aides ended up talking and bro- breaking it, breaking the story. And then people actually looked into it. And it, it, it like he's under serious investigation right now on top of his sexual allegations and all that other stuff. But that Sounds Trump, had sent out, Trump had sent out those big ships to New York and California. He sent out and he, they built the uh, Javits Center, the field hospital in the Javits Center, all the ventilators, all the masks, all everything you need. And Andrew Cuomo, rather than putting COVID patients into those areas that were available, he put them into nursing homes. Exactly. And it went through like wildfire yeah. in these nursing homes. And they estimated that up to 15,000 seniors were killed as a result of that decision, putting them in nursing homes. So that's a, that, because had he had used those, that ship or, or and or the field hospitals, that would have been a, in an election year, that would have made Trump look good, you know? And they couldn't do that. They had to put them back in the nursing homes and it went around like wildfire and killed them. Now, you can, bring, you can make up the argument, oh, well, that's not why he did it. Okay, but ask yourself, Trump sent, made an order for the Army Corps of Engineers to build out the Java Center to send out that big massive ship. Not one patient on either, in either one, but yeah, he's but yeah, Andrew Cuomo put put COVID positive patients back in nursing homes, which killed fifteen thousand seniors. I mean, if that's not politicalization, politicalization, Jesus, yeah. of, of if that's not politicizing well, something, that, well, that's I don't clear. Know what like to be honest, I never liked that Andrew Cuomo. Fucking yeah, Chris Cuomo fucking bullshit on TV anyway. It just yeah. What's mom? Yeah. What did mom loves me best? <laughs> All that type of bollocks. I was just like, <laughs> that, that, it was too fucking weird, man. Um, I, yeah, it, it was. Weird. I, 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 I can't probably... remember which guy it was. I remember which guy. Tom, we we'll change the subject a bit. When did you come to America first? Yeah, listen, you're right. Listen, you're right. We could talk around in circles about this thing, but you know what, boys? That's that was a very good um back and forth but yeah you're right look we'll go back and forth now forever and it's unfortunate <laughs> yeah but... that was a, that was a hell of a debate like i oh, yeah, yeah. no, no. necessarily agree when the series and i agree. think i think whoever listens to this will see well you got a bunch of boys there who are taking each other's points and and that's the way it should be though a healthy discussion is a good discussion exactly you know? exactly. Of course. exactly exactly but uh tell me that, hey the coffee isn't good for the panic attacks tom you want to watch out with the coffee? I know I'm grand now. I'm fucking, yeah, you yeah, yeah. Watch out. You gotta watch out. The coffee ain't good. <laughs> well, you're just Irish, Leslie. It was, it, it was again going back on what I was talking about. That was it. That was, you know, I'm, I'm turning 33 on Friday, and uh, you know, that was one of the first times I'd ever felt something like that. And I was like, wow, that's bizarre. Yeah. But I said to myself, if I'm feeling like this. I can only, and I, and I have the outlets and the discipline and the mindset to overcome it because I'm used to doing that. I'm used to challenges. I'm used to doing things like that on a weekly basis in the gym, you know, setting my goals or, or when I was competing or, you know, I'm still, you know, looking to compete in the likes of wrestling, jujitsu, all that other stuff. And I may or may not get back, back in the MMA cage. I never say never, but I have that upper, that, that, that mindset to be able to do that. And I, I it was, it was just, uh, it was a, crazy reality that i came to where i was like wow I, I can only imagine what other people are going to if if they're yeah. if, if i'm able to do this on a separate note how do you make your coffee i'm not a big coffee man i'm not a big I don't, coffee, I don't drink coffee, no. coffee coffee uh, one spoon and a dash of milk at the end no sugar but is that the instant coffee now you're talking about um i have a couple of different ones i'll, sh- I'll sh- wait there i'll show you which one i use okay <laughs> <laughs> I use whatever whatever coffee it is that I use. I'm uh, I'm more of a tea man. I'm more of a tea man. But what I wanted to know was how do you make it? Coffee. I, 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 you put, oh, put whiskey. Yeah, yeah. The just best put. way is to put whiskey in it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> a nice Irish whiskey. But I want to know how he makes it because so recently I I I, I kind of came across this method of making my coffee kind of by accident because I I ran out of method i had a you know a couple coffee makers and i had this and the other and they were old or broke or, and i never got the chance to go to the store to go get another method of making coffee you know i have the i have the french press i have the little metal uh, thing that makes the espresso percolator. Uh, percolator, percolator, yeah. percolator i have had the, the sock have you ever used the cotton sock 
where basically no. it's like it's like it's almost yeah, like yeah, a cotton, it's, it's a good, cotton yeah. netting. You put the coffee in, you pour the water into the cup into the sock, and then it filters through the sock. That's a great way of doing it. But this is this yeah. is the best way. The way it, so I'm like I'm fucking I don't I wake up one morning I'm like it was the weekend I'm like shit I never went to the store I never got I never got um uh, 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 something to make my coffee with so I went online and I'm like how do you make coffee without a coffee maker and this chef you it this off. chef it. from this restaurant uh they they call it cowboy cowboy coffee how the cowboys would have made it and that is you take a pot you fill it with water like just a regular pot regular regular uh, pan or saucepan you know a pot. Um, put uh, water in it, whatever, however many amount of water you think you're gonna, you know, end up having in your coffee. And then you 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 put the you put the coffee on top, like just in it, and it sits on top of the water, right? Put it on the put it on the burner, turn the burner on high, and then you just let that water heat up. And what happens is, it starts to heat up, and right before it starts bubbling, right as it starts to bubble, you take it off, you let it sit, and all the coffee sinks to the bottom. And it basically cooks into the water. Oh my god, it's super potent and it's so good. <laughs> I'm most hard to hear first. Uh, when when I was out, when... yeah, Steve, yeah. So that 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 way, I don't know if you heard me talking about the way of making the coffee there. About yeah, you, yeah. You, it's the water. You put the coffee on top. And you just turn the burner on high, and you let that eventually, uh, you know, boil right before it starts to really bubble. You take it off, let it sit, um, and then. Once those coffee grinds that go back down to the bottom, it just basically infuses with the water, and then you use that. And then you obviously have to, you don't just lash it in there. You don't want the, the grinds at the bottom to come in, but you just kind of like nice, nicely, you know, just pour it into the cup. Unbelievable. And it's a really handy way of doing this because everyone has everyone has a pot in there. Were you, were you a coffee were you a coffee drinker before you went to America? Because when I when I was living in America, the people the people that I was living with, and everyone, it was just coffee. If they didn't get coffee in the morning. There was all different types of coffee. Anything that you can think of. It was, there I, was the... I started drinking coffee when I was in Ireland only because at the time, uh, you know, I was training at SBG uh, with John Cavan and all of them. I was actually just talking to John Cavan yesterday over Facebook. Um, and we were training with these guys uh, in the Irish Strength Institute. Shout out to those guys, Owen Lacey and John Connor and all those guys. They're great, great guys. And uh, like they taught me a lot about eating right, healthy, all that stuff. And like they're, they're the real deal. And you can look them up. I, the Irish Strength Institute, you can look them up. But um, they were explaining to me uh, that coffee, especially when, you, when you're an athlete and, you know, your body's getting beat up and you're looking to this, that, and you, know, you need that little that little perk me up, you know, or it would pick me up, I should say. Uh, they said coffee is a very good natural um form of energy, uh, natural way to get that energy and it also help you, helps you be insulin resistant so that when you're eating the likes of sugars and carbs that you're not going to be releasing as much insulin into the bloodstream there's a there's a bunch of different foods that do that like uh, you know cinnamon does that fish oil there's a bunch of different things that can do that to help you keep your insulin levels down lower so you're not metabolizing these sugars and carbs into fat you're going to burn them up for energy instead and that helps a lot with the recovery and so I started drinking coffee when I started learning that and um, and then of course by the time I came to America, then full time, I was like, yeah, let's get a fucking Dunkin' kit, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, next thing you know, I'm going to Dunkin', yeah. and you know, you're shooting this shit with the other Boston guys in there in the morning. It's good time, yeah. But the whole yeah. thing, that, the whole thing that goes around with the coffee is what I like. You know, you're drinking your coffee, you're shooting the shit, you're talking to people. You're, it's that five minutes before work, you kind of, you know, offload some stuff for you, just whatever. You're talking about the news, the Patriots, the UFC, whatever. So yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Wait, when did when did you when did you go to America first, Tom? So I'm very lucky. Like since I've been a kid, um, you know, you know yourselves. Like most people there in Ireland, they'll you know save up and maybe they'll go to Spain or they'll go to you know other places for vacation if they can afford it. Of course, you know whatever you know people do their own thing. But my parents were on the lines of like. I don't know what it was. I guess, you know, we always just, you know, we're always somewhat Americanized in the sense they're very familiar with the American um, culture going up because my dad and my mom were like, well, instead of like, you know, and they worked very hard, you know, for when me and my kid were, when me and my brother were kids, like they worked incredibly hard. And, and my dad, you know, he still works nonstop. What, what, all the time. what did they do? Uh, my dad, my dad actually, he, my dad was always involved in computers. And he got involved in computers, obviously, in the late in the 80s. 
So he was kind of like, he was kind of going in. Uh, he was kind of already involved in software and whatnot, right when all the you know internet boom happened and everything like that. And then he ended up do, uh, starting up his own computer software business, selling software, programming software. And then he kind of kind of inadvertently fell into um, uh, a truck truck company called McIlvenny Motors. There, uh, one of them's in um, one of them one of the bases is in um, in um, Jesus in Dublin. There, why, why can't I think of the name? And then the other one's in Monaghan. Uh, so he does obviously software, but he also helps manage this truck truck business that he kind of fell into because he had, he they had bought his software, and then it, it got to the point where they you know he ended up helping run the company. Um, so and then my mom obviously my mom's done a bunch of things, but um, but they would save up, um, and every couple of years you know we wouldn't we wouldn't go on vacation or anything like that or holidays. We'd kind of just you know be at home, but every couple of years we they would be like, all right, we've saved up, let's go to Florida, let's go to Disneyland, you know, so. Oh, cool. um, so me and my younger brother, we, we were lucky to be exposed to some of that stuff at a young, younger age into our teens. So we were kind of very used to the American culture, so to speak. Well, we were used to Florida. Florida is a lot different than, let's say, Boston or, or New York or whatever. But um, but rather than rather than, let's say, us saving up and going to Spain or Portugal or somewhere warm like that that was closer, they would save up and maybe we wouldn't go on holidays for a few years. But then we would uh, we would go to Florida, you know. And um, so, but, but I, so that, that I was very familiar at least with, with American culture by the time I came to Boston, but when I came to, the reason why I came in Boston, came to Boston was because after UFC 93, um, uh, you know, I lost to John Hathaway, me and John Cavanaugh were sitting out back and you had Marcus Davis was fighting on that card and his coach at the time was uh, Mark Delagrati, who I know and, and I talk, still talk to Mark, his gym is not far from here in Somerville and, um, he said to me after the fight, he goes, oh, why don't you come to Boston and try a bit of training with us, you know? And I'm looking at Kevin and I said, John, what do you think about that? He goes, yeah, yeah, go ahead, man. You know, go over there, see what it's all about. And if you want, you know, go check it out. And I said, all right, cool. I said, John, maybe you can come as well. He goes, yeah, yeah, I'll think about it. He goes, but you go ahead. <laughs> so, and then it turned out a friend of a friend of the family had an apartment in South Boston and uh, I was able to stay there. And then while I was staying there to obviously go to Mark Delagrati's place in Somerville, which is kind of a bit of a pain in the ass of a trek. Um, it turned out, I found out Peter Welch's gym was right around the corner. And Peter Welch, obviously, was a boxing coach boxing on the coach, Ultimate Fighter. Yeah. and everything like that. So, and then it turns out all Mark Delagrati's guys, like Kenny Florian, Jorge Rivera, all these guys, old school UFC guys, they were all going to Peter's anyways. So I just started training there because it was right next to the, right next to the apartment. And then, so that was 2009. Then I ended up in Vegas for a few weeks. I was training, training at Extreme Couture's with the likes of Forrest Griffin, Tyson Griffin, uh, Junie Brownie, Matt Danzig, uh, Phil Baroni. I was sparring with Phil Baroni, the New York badass. Like, it was a crazy time. And then I came back to Ireland. And then just 2009, I was just saying, fuck, I'd love to go back out there to Boston again. And uh, I had a friend of mine, great man frank delaney is his name from galway i still very good friends with him now to this point and he while i was here he had said to me hey look if you ever want to come out here and give this place a go you know you can stay with me until you get on your feet and, and and see what happens and and i'd only ever met him when i came out here just to, just for training but i hit him up i remember it was like december 2009 i said i want to go back out to boston and give it a go and uh i hit frank up and i said frank i want to take you up on that offer and he goes yep yeah, offer still there come on out Next thing you know, I'm in Boston. I'm doing all my networking and whatnot. And I just walked into Peter Welch's gym just to say hi, just because, like, oh, you know, I was here last year. And and then the manager there at the time, um, this guy, his name was Moses. And um, and it's funny because, I, you know, I'm a bit of a religious guy. Well, I wouldn't be religious in the sense that I go to church every Sunday, but I'd be a faithful guy, you know. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, and you know you're over here and i have a few bob in me pocket and you know things weren't looking good it was like I, I was starting i was slowly realizing that i was looking to work in a gym and most gyms obviously didn't really want to you know put their neck out there and give me a job without me obviously having work visas and all that kind of stuff because i was only over here initially on the esta just to see what i could do and then obviously i was yeah. going to go back and forth and do all that stuff and uh and i just happened to walk into peter's and he was like, uh, they were like, yeah, um, geez, uh, 
you know, are you staying here? I wants to start. I said, yeah, I'm just trying to get a job at a gym. They're like, well, we're expanding here and we do everything by independent contractor and whatnot. Would you be interested in, in like working with us? And, and Peter was willing to put his neck out there to help me with the visas and the work visas and all that kind of stuff. He said, yeah, I'll help you, whatever you need. I was like, that's I was so like great. hallelujah. <laughs> that's yeah, yeah, that's... Uh, so long story short, I ended up just, uh, yeah, I did my back and forth, all that kind of stuff with the visas and everything. And, um, you know, Peter was super helpful putting, putting himself out there for me and I was able to work and, and uh, yeah. And then I became a citizen last year. It's amazing. Oh, that, Congratulations. That, that, that means so much. Pressure off you as well. I suppose when you're a citizen, at least you can come over and back and gives you that freedom. Yeah. Well. well, so, oh yeah. Like that was the thing when I first came over here, I, I remember, and it was, it was difficult. I mean, like, like anything, when you're trying to do anything right, you know, can often be harder on the person who's trying to do the right thing than it is for somebody who's trying to do the, you know, you know how that yeah. goes, but yeah. I, um, yes. I did me back and forth and I initially was working on, so between when Peter was like, yeah, I'll, I'll help you out. And, and, um, and then obviously I was, uh, working on a P1 visa, which is for athletes to come over here and fight professionally. Sure. And then I was doing, I, I had gotten another visa called a B1, B2, which is a tourist slash business visa. So I was doing me back and forth, doing me back and forth. And I was doing this, that, and you know, I was going through this P1 application and I was trying to go through all this kind of stuff. And that was, and I'd been going back to Ireland. I'd been coming back over and, you know, and, and thanks to Peter, Peter was, you know, still let me keep my spot where I was able to do personal training and all this kind of stuff. And, uh, and then like a year, it was like a year and a half, maybe a year, a little less than a year and a half into doing this back and forth stuff, working on, you know, visas and whatnot. I was, I'd been dating a girl at the time. We were like dating for maybe like a year, a year. No, at that point we were dating about a year and a year and some change. And uh, cause I'd known her and we've, we've been dating, living, you know, been kind of living together at the time. And she was just like, Hey, I'm sick of this nonsense of you going back and forth and everything like that. And, you know, we've been living together, dating over a year. And she was like, you know, we should just get married. And I was just like, what? And I was super stubborn about it. I was like, no, I don't want to do that. I want to, you know, I had it all, my whole plan laid out with the P1 visa and I wanted to do all that stuff. And then I just had a buddy of mine say to me, here, Tom, you're retired. If you're going to go through all this stuff, you know, you're trying to do the right thing. You're going through all these visas and, and you know, you're going all your back and forth. If you, if you have a girl sitting there and she's like, yeah. and, she, and, and he's like, he was like, look, you obviously love each other. You're living together and all this kind of stuff. You know, you're retarded if you don't take her up on, on that and and, uh, and you guys don't do that. So it's funny. Yeah, we ended up getting married out in Vegas and, and that was a that was a mad scene as well. And then and then and then then at that point I was like, well, you know, this is obviously the universe or God or whatever you want to call it, just saying, look, yeah, you know, you've been putting in your balls, putting your balls out there, trying to work to do all the right thing. Here's a little here's a little step for you. And it's funny that happens because you don't know what way your life's going to go. Um, especially, you know, in certain situations, like I'll give you an example. This, uh, this girl who worked at a coffee shop right by where I was living in Dorchester. I used to see her all the time. Um, Polish girl, very nice girl. Still friends with her right now. Um, she initially wanted to start working out me doing personal training and just turned out that she was looking to get, um, an internship for, uh, an architectural uh, in an architectural firm and um and that's what she needed in order to continue her her student visa here in the u.s otherwise she would have had to uh you know leave or not allowed, not able to be here and uh, so i was like oh i one of my one of my other clients uh happens to be like a, a big um executive in in like a big uh construction company here in boston he knows all the architectural firms in the city uh, and they're the biggest ones in the Northeast. I said, let me see if I can have him get you an interview. So long story short, I managed, to, I got her an interview with one of the biggest architectural firms in Boston. And when they looked at her portfolio, they didn't, they didn't only want to give her uh, an internship, which would allow her to stay here on a student visa. They hired her, they gave her a job and they took care of her immigration for her. They said, we, we want to hire you. We love your designs. We love your work. And then a year into her work visa, she was obviously dating a guy that whole time and they ended up, they ended up getting married. Now they're married and she's in an architectural firm and she's killing it. So you just don't know that's what brilliant. way your that's life brilliant. goes. That's great, man. America, America is full. Of, it is the land of opportunity. And if you push yourself out there, if you push yourself out there, good things will happen. I've always yeah. said that about America. Yeah. And, and that, that for me obviously was, was, was very rewarding because, you know, I've had 
people helped me out along the way um, who, who allowed me to get to certain points and, and do things like that. So when I was able to give back uh, like that to somebody who like, and this girl is very sweet girl, super hard working. And she just, you know, she was doing everything right. She had to do the back and forth thing and everything like that. And all she needed was just that opportunity just to have an interview. And, uh, and it's just bizarre. Like, all she was looking for was an internship just so she could stay here on a student visa and be able to work at the coffee shop and not have to worry. And uh, they said, no, we'll hire you. So she, 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 she got to become a full-time architect while still studying, having her immigration paid for uh, and looked after. And, uh, and then eventually, yeah, she, she dated a guy and, and yeah, now they're married and they're, they seem to be doing well. That's brilliant. That's brilliant. That's, that's the positivity, having an open mindset as well. She had an open mindset, you had an open mindset. That's it. That's it. That gets you yeah. through with a lot of things. Yeah. And like, you know, so, you know, she's on her little journey now, but, you know, regardless now, she's, you know, she's doing well. So that's good. But yeah, it, I mean, so, yeah. And the next thing you know, you know, well, obviously, uh, you know, if, uh, I went a few years into obviously being with my ex at the time and, and you know, about four years into it, it just wasn't working out. We decided to, we mutually decided that it wouldn't work out. But at that point in then time, I was able to, you know, I was able to stay here. I was still able to go back and forth. I was still working. I was doing all my stuff. Then I ended up going out on my own, started my own uh, personal training business at the gym that I'm at now, running the MMA programs there now. And then, yeah, then a few years after that, I was able to become a citizen, which was very rewarding. And now, even though I had a green card, I was still, you still kind of have that feeling like technically if I had, if I had a DUI, which is considered a felony in Massachusetts, uh, they yeah. deem it as a felony if you have a DUI, they could have deported me. Yeah. So, even, even though you had a green card. Even though I had a green card. Yeah. Because if, you know, if you, if, if when you have a green card in America, you're, you're, you're still, you, if you're a, if you turn to be a criminal. Yeah. yeah. If you turn to be a criminal, you're a permanent resident of the United States. So you do fall under, you, you do fall under um a lot of the con you have a lot of all your constitutional rights like i was able to get my gun license and everything like that and work and everything but uh but you you uh yeah if you if you you know if you get arrested or depending on I, what you get i've heard arrested. i've heard of people even with green cards uh being in car crashes and literally running like if it was if they thought it was their fault they just left the car there and actually just run because they were afraid that if if they got found guilty of of drinking under intoxication or anything wrong that it, they would be yeah. sent home and it was it was it was worth it uh, you know it was worth running away from just to avoid that and leaving the car there and even personal belongings or a laptop or whatever just leave it all there just leave it there and let me go yeah, yeah. but now yeah. like when i remember i remember when i became a citizen they shouldn't, they shouldn't have been looking at the laptop while driving <laughs> 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 having a wine but, but uh yeah <laughs> But I remember when I got sworn in after the ceremony, I uh, I had a Guinness or two in me and I just looked around. My family, my, my, my parents came over for it. It was beautiful. And it was crazy. 2020, January, January 23rd, 2020. Wow. Like it happened right before the pandemic. I was able to fucking have all my family here. And we were able to go to the nightclubs afterwards. It was mad, mad. Class. But um, uh, I remember I remember sitting there at a few pints in me. I'm in my suit and I just go, well, they can't get rid of me now. No one deport me this time. <laughs> <laughs> That's great, man. You, yeah, it from, was good. It was good. You, you from, mentioned this time. What? Sorry, Chris. What was it like being in the UFC? What was that I was like? Say, you mentioned UFC through? 93. Like, you, like you, another thing no one could take away from you. The first Irishman to go and do it. Like, yeah. That's. Yeah. I mean, I I like to. That, that's it's. It's definitely something nice you can hang on to a bit of history. You have a bit of history when you when you because uh, like you know typically when when fighters get into the fight game they'll do it for you know a number of different reasons and those reasons might change over time. Like when I first started fighting, I only ever wanted to get I only ever wanted to do it just to prove to myself that you know that I had the stones or the balls to actually get in there and do it. That's all I ever wanted to do. I, I had no intentions of like in the beginning at least. I had no intentions of like, you know, going on and doing certain things or, or at least, you know, let alone, you know, having something historical that I could have my name put to uh, put next to, but um, you know, your, your intentions and your aspirations and the, what you want to do with yourself tends to change little by little as time goes on. Then when I started winning and I started, you know, win fights decisively and 
all of a sudden I proved to myself that I could do this. Now it became more, well, what, what else can I do with this? Where can I go with this? Like now I started to actually aspire, well, I can actually do something more with this, you know? Um, but yeah, it's pretty amazing that like, you know, less than two years after starting MMA, I was fucking fighting in the UFC. Yeah, it was bizarre. I, I, um, I, I watched, I watched a little, I watched a couple of clips of, of you, of, of, of it today. It must've been an absolute mad experience. But before, before uh, UFC 93, you, you were, you were obviously in with that group. You were, you were, you were in Belfast beforehand. And there's a, you tell a beautiful story about, um, being on a night out with the likes of Dana, Dana White and yeah, Lorenzo Fertitta and yeah, yeah. yeah. And I'd, lo- and I'd love for you to tell I'd love for you to tell that that story story here because because uh, in just fairness you took you took the credit for bringing the UFC to Dublin. <laughs> <laughs> Go on, don't don't lie to us now. You said that you didn't say it was my fault. Like <laughs> yeah, yeah. I uh, well, it's just yeah, exactly. Yeah, you're right. That's actually funny. I didn't realize that. Yeah, I um. Yeah, it was just, it was just, so again, shout out to my friend, uh, Dwyer McCauley, who's been top to bottom, like a pivotal part in my, my, um, you know, pre UFC days, you know, he, he allowed me, so he, he was friends with my father, they played golf together and Dwyer became one of the main guys in Satanta sports when that first got developed, they first got the contract for showing the UFC fights, um, you know, in the likes of Ireland and UK and, um, and he was just like, he would get front row, you know, cage side seats to every event pretty much that was going on in the UK and Ireland uh, when it came to the UFC. And so he would always say, Tom, I can't make it. Um, or maybe he was lying. I don't know. But he would say, here, do you want a ticket and or two tickets? You can take a friend to the fights and I'll see you there. Or, or maybe, you know, he's like, you can take my tickets, their executive tickets or whatever. And like, like again, shout out to him, Dwyer McCauley. Like, and he's actually helped Artem Lobov. Funny enough, he's helped Artem Lobov out a lot with Artem's comment. Uh, com- when Artem was doing a lot of commentary uh, in uh, uh, Russian commentary on on MMA fights and stuff. Oh yeah, cool. Um, uh, Dwyer McCauley was helping him a lot, and uh, Dwyer's just a great man, very very selfless guy. He'll help anybody out. Uh, he is actually it was his friends who got me the apartment in South Boston, which allowed me to even come here in the first place in 2009. So obviously he's a great man, but uh, but yeah, he had tickets for me for the UFC Belfast fights, and um, so I was obviously able to be there. And um, I was sitting ringside, and I'm just sitting there, like I'm watching Rampage Jackson. He had just knocked out Chuck Liddell. He's walking around with his UFC belt on, and he had this mink, this this big fur coat on. He's walking around with his grill on, and I was just like, "Holy shit!" But yeah, long story short, oh, and, and John Kavanagh. It's funny enough, John Kavanagh was cornering Rory Singer that night, who fought in the Ultimate Fighter. So it was just so funny that I'm there ringside, Kavanagh is there, and with 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 Kavanagh, and obviously sitting ringside and talking to people. We were finding out that you know what was going on after the fights, and I was explaining this in that other uh, podcast that I was on, the, the Energizer one that you guys were alluding to there, that where I was telling them the story about. Mm how um you know back then ufc after parties were all just held in the hotel where everybody was basically staying versus nowadays you got fighters promotions they have their own clubs or their own setups that they all have everybody go to and whatnot but back then everybody just partied together in the hotel that they were staying at so everybody could just get fucked up and then go to sleep you know basically and um and actually it became i became pretty good friends with ed herman uh this night ed herman's a cool dude uh because he was he had fought that night and won, and um, but yeah, we're at this after party and it's just a who's who list is there because at this at that point in time the UFC would fly out, you know, big name fighters to these events in the likes of the UK and Ireland to kind of really promote it, um, so that they'd want to get more people going there. People who knew what the UFC was, they'd be like, shit, fucking Rampage Jackson's going to be there or Chuck Liddell's going to be there or Matt Hughes or whoever. They may not be fighting, but they'll be there in the crowd. So that's important enough. I need to go. I need to go. You know. So, so I was able to obviously the times that I would be at these things, I would meet the who's who of, of all these guys. But anyways, this particular after party, yeah, you had everybody was there. But as the night's going on, all kinds of stuff was going on. Like I said, John Cavill was rolling around on the ground. <laughs> I think he was rolling around on the ground with uh, with Hodger, Hodger Gracie because I had no idea that at one point in time, the Gracies had sent Hodger Gracie to live with John Cavill. So Hodger Gracie, who's like, Arguably one of the best jiu-jitsu players in the world, 
lived with John Kavanagh. Wow. And uh, John oh, Kavanagh really? has this funny story where he dressed uh, he dr- he dressed Hodger Gracie up as a fairy for Christmas and said that that's just what you do. <laughs> 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 and Hodger Gracie, like, not, being familiar, not being familiar with the customs, was like, oh, really? You guys dress up as fairies around here? And Cam was like, yeah, yeah, it's very important. So, like, it's hilarious. John could, pl- John could tell you that story if you ever got him on. But, um, but John, when John gets drunk, he does that. He ends up rolling around the ground with who's who. He's like, I'll fucking submit you or whatever. I forget who he was rolling around the ground with. But, um, that's what he does when he gets drunk. But uh, yeah, I ended up just in this circle of, of people. Um, again, like I said, I, I, it was me, my friend, Brian, Brian Fury. Shout out to Brian Fury. He's a great guy. One of my, one of my closest friends from, from, from when growing up in Newbridge. Um, so we had me, Brian, Eddie Bravo, Joe Rogan. Uh, Rampage Jackson was there briefly at one point. And then who else was in there? Uh, and then, yeah, and then John Kevin obviously joined in, you know, what, when, he, when he got off the floor. But um, <laughs> <laughs> basically, I was in the middle of, t- I was basically just trying to tell Joe Rogan and Eddie Bravo that, you know, that Belfast was great and all. But I was like, it's not really like, you know, if you guys really want to get the whole Irish feel, you guys got to come down to Dublin. It's the only way. Like that, like you, the, I was like, the place, we're going insane. And I was like, you've no idea how big it is down there right now. I was like, and then I started rattling off the likes of McGregor, Ashton Daly, Pendred, you know, Chris Fields, all these guys. And I was like, we uh, own Roddy. I was like, we got all these guys down there. You guys just, you'll kill it down there. And then it just so happened to that, like, you know, Dana and Lorenzo and Frank were, were, were kind of squeezing by. They were, they were, I guess they were all just leaving. And, and Joe, who'd been high, drunk, whatever, he just grabbed Dana and he goes, Dana, Dana, get in on this, get in on this. And I said on the podcast, but Dana, he does, he's got this fucking big shiny fat head and he just leans in and he's just like, <laughs> he's like yeah, what's up, what's up? And um, there, there, Joe was like, yeah, you listen to this kid. He's like, tell him what you just said. I said, I said, the UFC, Belfast, I said, great. But I said, if, you, if you're in Ireland, it, you, you got to come down to Dublin. I said, you have to come down to Dublin. I said, it'll, it'll be off the charts. And I, again, I rattled a couple of names off. I said, there'll be so many potential people down there. You know, you got to come down there. And, uh, and then John, I think John had just popped up. And I was like, John, right, right. Am I right about this? And John was like, yep, yep, yep. Listen to him, listen to him. And then he was back off doing whatever he was doing. Rolling around on the ground, <laughs> but uh, he uh, Dana White was like, All right, yeah, 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 sounds yeah, all right, sounds pretty good, sounds pretty good. And Joe's like, Yeah, yeah, but seriously, like, you know, this sounds like a good idea because Joe's you know, he's high and he's like, Yeah, he's all into it. Dana's like, Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, we look into it. And I was like, Yeah, seriously. So they ended up going off, and uh, yeah, like I said before, it was just funny that I ended up being the one that fought on that card when they did come down to Dublin. Uh, it's just crazy, bizarre to think that that's how that worked out, you know what I mean. That must have been been some experience. Oh, like crazy. Um, Crazy experience. And I'm not quite sure. No, I never really got the chance to tell Dana the night of the UFC when they weren't up. I never got to actually, uh, you know, talk about that story. I would have loved to have actually said, hey, by the way, that was fucking me that made you guys come here, motherfuckers. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but another 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 funny story that I left out when I was telling that story before was, so we're all standing around, um, and John Kavanagh is drunk as a skunk, and he, uh, Forrest Griffin had fought that night and won, and Forrest Griffin was walking around this big long leather trench coat, and it was really bizarre, and he's like skull and shots. And um, yeah, like I said, you had Hodger Gracie, who I, I don't think was drinking. I think Hodger Gracie is pretty sober. He's just kind of standing there, very, you know, collected looking guy. And there's a bunch of different things going on. And uh, John Kavanagh goes to uh, Forrest Griffin, hey, Forrest. And, and Forrest is like, what? And he goes, that guy pointed out my friend Brian. <laughs> that guy said he wants you to punch him. And Forrest just goes, all right. And Forrest, <laughs> boom. <laughs> 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 He dropped a right hand into his stomach. My friend Brian, <laughs> I'll never forget. Brian was so happy, shocked, but like couldn't breathe at the same time. So he's like, put the on the ground. He's on the ground, curled up. And, and then Forrest just goes, I need to get all that under the shot. And John Cavan is dying laughing. And like, because John saw that Forrest was obviously, you know, getting a little messed up. But John was like, hey, Forrest, punch him in the stomach. And Forrest didn't even ask any questions. He goes, all right. 
Boom! <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I'm like putting it on the ground, like, yeah. what? He's like, oh, fucking if, if you watched UFC, uh, the Ultimate Fighter season one, you wouldn't be surprised because Forrest is a funny bastard. He does not. Yeah, he's a funny bastard. Funny but I, just, I actually have his phone number now, and, and we, every time I see him at events and stuff, like, he always, like, takes a minute or two to, to chat with me well, and catch great. up, like, it is. It's really cool. He's a he's a cool dude. I love Forrest Griffin. But yeah. Anyway, that was that was from that night. Um, and yeah, it's funny that. And, and anyways, I ended up fighting on that card um, when they were in Dublin, which was pretty pretty amazing. And then I, and then our fight, like me and John Hathaway's fight, ended up being. I, I I'm pretty sure. Yeah, it was. It was the first preliminary fight that had been on a UFC press conference um, at right. that time. So that was another cool little little thing. You nice. know. Would you be tempted to go back if you got a call up to UFC again? Would you be tempted to go back fighting? Um, like if they called me to fill in for like a UFC event or something like that, geez, they, uh, that'd be hard to turn down, wouldn't it? If they, but I mean, like, yeah, you know, obviously, I'd, I'd want it to be merited though. I, I'd want to, I'd want to work, you know. I'd obviously want to fight my way in there and stuff like that. But look, like I said, I never say never. I'm, only, I'm I mean, I say I'm only thirty three. I know that's supposed to be old, but in in this world and in, in this era of sports and nutrition and, and the way things are going, like, you know, 33 is still, still prime. So, um, and you, and you're relatively, you're relatively low mileage for the game as well. Yeah. I'm relatively low mileage, yeah, you know, yeah. like the way things happened, I, you know, I had a couple of injuries. I had some things, you know, obviously moving over to America, visa stuff, you know, certain things that's that even while I was here and I wanted to be actively competing, that was preventing me from competing. And then, um, and then ultimately, like after my last fight, I, I just felt like I said to myself, look, I just I like again, not that I wasn't a thousand percent on the night because I fought who's now a very good friend of mine, uh, Chip Pollard, who's a multiple time uh, Muay Thai world champion. Like he's easily pound for pound, probably the best Muay Thai fighter in the world right now. And um, we had fought in 2014, which is crazy to think it was that long ago. And uh, great, great fight. I recommend anybody watch it. It's a great back and forth. But I went in there. Rather than going in there saying, oh, I'm going to fucking go in there and win this. I went in there with an experimental mindset, fighting this high-level guy, still a thousand percent wanting to go in there. And then after the fight, after I'd lost, I'd lost a decision. I, I, I didn't do enough in the first round and the second round was questionable. And then I won the third round, definitely. But after the fight, I was like, I remember saying to myself, saying, right, until you are just like, like, you feel like 5,000 million percent that this is exactly what you want to do. I said, I said, you owe it to yourself to not do it until you are just like, until that switch goes off in your head, you know? Like I said, not that I wasn't on the night. On the night, I was as good as I could have been on that night against, against uh, when I fought him. I was, he fought the best, he, he fought the best of me that night. But after the fight, you know, when you're talking to yourself and you're, you know, questioning, you know, what are, you know, how, how could I have done things and this, that, and the other. I said, I said, well, first thing I said, I said, well, you don't, you don't use a, a world-class striker to experiment whether you can strike in a fight or not. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? You do that in the gym and then you fucking fight. Right. But uh, I said, that was number one. Then number two, I said afterwards, I said, right. I said, I'm, I said, let's take a bit of time off. Let's just reevaluate. And then I've been going through there's some personal things that I had happen after the fight as well. But I said to myself, I'm going to wait until I'm a thousand, million thousand percent switched on before we get in the cage again. And uh, and it just so happened then that I just fell into coaching roles. I fell into a bunch of other stuff. Then McGregor stuff. McGregor was coming up at the time. He was asking me to do things with him. So I was traveling, doing that. And so just a range of different things happened. And I just never, you know, at that time, I never turned around and said that, all right, I, my, my, I didn't have that massive urge to get back in the cage right away. And then after a couple of years, I, I started competing in jiu-jitsu wrestling again. I never got the chance to wrestle. So I want to do more wrestling tournaments. And I did, I did a tournament here in, 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 that was held in Boston. It's a New England one. And it's an, it's an open wrestling tournament. You've got, you know, you'll have like collegiate guys. You'll have uh, guys who've been wrestling their whole lives. You'll have guys, maybe some MMA guys jumping in on this wrestling tournament. Um, and, I, and, I, and I that was one of the ones now where, I, I was like, all right, I'm fucking, I'm not losing this. I'm winning this fucking thing. And, and I, I won all my, I, won, I had four matches in the one day and I won all of them. And that oh, was me going, awesome. that was me going, yeah, yeah. And it was that like, the weight was at 197. And these are guys who are collegiate wrestlers and they were like fucking, some of these were like m monkeys, these guys. They were, 
<laughs> fucking jacked. And you know how wrestling's going to be. They're going to be solid. Yeah, I put my balls into that, into training for that. And uh, yeah, four matches in the one day against like these guys who were pretty tough. And, and afterwards, I was like, I was like, all right, that's what I'm talking about. That's the mindset that I, that I, that I knew that I wanted to have. Um, and that was 2019. Then we had, a, that was summer 2019. Then we had a couple of guys fighting from my gym. And then next thing you know, I was, I was that December, then I was busy applying for my citizenship. Then I became a citizen January and then fucking COVID hit. So I never really got the chance then to kind of get back into that competitive mindset. But with things opening up again, I, I am looking to compete more wrestling because that's obviously something that I, I mean, I've competed jujitsu, I've competed kickboxing, karate, MMA. I've done all those things as a martial artist, as a martial who I feel like I would, I would call myself a true martial artist. I want to be able to compete in everything. I competed in, in did some boxing stuff as well. I want to be able to say that I've done all these different types of things. So I want to compete in wrestling again. And I want to get my black belt in jujitsu. I want to do a lot of those things. And maybe along the way, I'll say, fuck it. I'll jump in the ring and fight MMA again. Who knows? We, we had Ashling Daly on there. Um, what was it? Last week, a week and a half ago or thereabouts. She was brilliant. She like, great woman. I, oh, she's yeah. absolutely class. An absolute diamond. Like, but she was yeah. talking about, you know, being in that first group and you were very much at the pinnacle of that, that group as well, that SBG group, that Celtic MMA group. Um, like what was the energy like in being part of that with the likes of Paddy Hoon, Carl Pendred, Conor McGregor, Ashling Daly, Chris Fields, you know, all, all those guys coming through at one time, obviously under the tutelage of um, John Kavanagh, like. Well, I would actually argue that Ashley Daly was actually kind of in the pinnacle at the time. Like she was actually the first to win a world title. She was out there competing on the big stages, cage rage at the time. Like I, like I just happened to be the guy who got the UFC call. Uh, okay. But Ash, I, I would actually say that, and I, again, I appreciate that. I take that as a compliment. You're saying that I was the pinnacle at the time. And, and I feel at least for me, what I was doing in, in my weight class at the time in Ireland, I was the guy I was saying to myself, I'm the fucking guy here at this, but, in terms of, for me, who was making the most amount of breakthroughs, and, and, and I think I, I would actually argue that Ash was the one. Uh, it just sucked that at the time we didn't have a women's division in the UFC because I I undoubtedly would believe that Ash probably would have been the first one to get the call um, had there been a women's division. But, you know, we don't know so because that didn't happen. I happened to be that guy. But, yeah, um, what was it like? Um, I mean, yeah, it was incredible looking back, knowing that, you know, that you know, essentially, yeah, I was the, me and Ash were, were kind of putting a lot of the work in. We were definitely the, the front runners on the, on the, uh, when it came to getting on the bigger stage or getting noticed and whatnot. Oh, 100%. And, um, and that was all credit again, yeah, to John Kavanagh for the opportunities that we got. And also too, for, you know, friends of ours who were helping promote us, you know, we had friends who were helping promote us along the way on social media and stuff like that. So, but yeah, it was, I mean, it was, it was pretty cool. It was pretty cool. And like, yeah, like it would have been interesting for me, for me, maybe if I had stayed in Ireland a little bit longer and maybe got to feel out what that would have been like, but I just had an itch on my shoulder and it was nothing, nothing personal to anybody, you know, any, any, anybody at all. I was going through my own growing pains, my own personal stuff. And yes. I wanted to, I just felt like I wanted to get up and get out and go you know experience different things and that's why i came to america and, and i have no regrets zero regrets but at that time yeah it was it was very it was a really interesting raw time of uh, just some some days just me mcgregor ashling you know maybe chris feels roddy in the gym and other days i might be pendred other days you know maybe just four or five is at the gym sometimes it's mad it's crazy you you must wake up some mornings and uh, or some days you must just think to yourself fucking hell look what I did or look what I was involved in. It must be crazy. You must be very proud as well to to be the first UFC Irish UFC fight fighter. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I mean that it, it means more when I hear that stuff coming from other people. So I appreciate you saying that. That means a lot. Like you know when I hear things relayed back to me, um, it does it does make me say for a second. Yeah, you know yeah you fucking did that man. <laughs> yeah yeah exactly. Uh, but, That's what you should. Yeah. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. And yeah, and and, and I'm not afraid, you know, I don't necessarily walk around, and, oh, you know, I'm the first, I, I don't even have it on my bios, on my Instagram, on my Facebook or anything like that. Um, not that I do that. Like, I just, 
you know, I, yeah, I do. I, I think about it and I'm, you know, very proud of what I've been able to do. And I, But I'm very grateful. I'm very grateful for like, you know, I never forget the people who helped me along the way, you know, like I, I'm very grateful to have had certain people, um, you know, help me and give me the opportunities that I have. And it all starts with my parents. I always go back to my parents. Everything starts with my parents. They gave me all the opportunity in the world. They didn't like me doing MMA. They didn't want me going into a cage fighting grown men, <laughs> you know, with very little rules, but they gave me the opportunity to do it. And my dad, you know, and my mom, like my mom, my mother was the martial artist of the family. And my mother, my mother did Shotokan karate uh, for years. And, she, and Shotokan karate is a brutal, like, I mean, Shotokan karate, they, when you compete in Shotokan, it's basically, they don't wear any gloves. Uh, some, some people wear a mouthpiece. I believe some wear a cup. That's it. No shin pads, no padding, no nothing. And it's full contact. Now, you can't punch to the face. You can only punch to the body because they want the, 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 the kicking art, the kicking form of the art to be, to be the main spectacle of the competition. Because in Shotokan, if, if you're looking people to, to compete with their karate skills and you give people the option of boxing each other in the face sure it'll turn into people just throwing big haymakers and stuff like that so mm -hmm. that's it. naturally you say no keep the keep the punches the rules are keep the punches to the body but the kicks you can kick to the head so you look at some shoulder cam fights and you're like oh, there's some brutal knockouts and my mom used to do that she would travel around ireland with wow. her group and and she would do that and uh yeah she got it she she was a black belt in shoulder can she got her black belt and, then and that, she, what that would have been in this 70s 80s ireland uh yeah like like that would have been late 70s early 80s yeah yeah yeah, late yeah. 70s, early oh, 80s. Wow. so like she was traveling around doing that and, <laughs> and uh yeah um so like that is that's just absolutely badass you know she has again, a bonus. again that's that's a woman ahead of her time really yeah 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 she was one of the only it was her I think it was her and one other girl and then it was a bunch of the guys that were in in that karate gym that she was uh, training out of um and they were going around all over ireland like wherever they could do karate tournaments and like, like i said like that's not not an easy sport shotokan like the, the like shotokan is a very very tough uh form of competition like like i said if you were to google shotokan karate fights like you'll see some brutal knockouts brutal knockouts mm -hmm. um so anyways, long story short, then when I was a young lad, you know, my mom allowed my dad, you know, gave him first dibs on what I was going to get into. And I never really took to soccer. never really, like, I loved soccer. I loved playing football. I, I loved playing golf. Still do. My brother's a phenomenal golfer. Um, he's, like, going to be professional. And, um, but I took more to, like, the martial arts, I think. So when that really wasn't working out, my mom was like, right, it's my turn. And then she sent me to a guy named Roy Baker. Uh, Roy is one of the biggest names in and uh, like uh, Irish kickboxing or sport karate. Um, and like, he's an international figure when it comes to as well. He runs the Irish open uh, every year, which is, has been the biggest, uh, most, one of the most prestigious, um, you know, tournaments for whether it be kickboxing or point fighting or whatever uh, in the world. Uh, you've made, you know, you have Michael Venom page and the likes of Raymond Daniels, who, who went on to become massive stars in the likes of kickboxing or Bellator, who would have started um, competing in those tournaments like the Irish Open. And Roy became, you know, he gave me my black belt in, in, in karate. And, uh, or, uh, and like, you know, that's another man who I owe a lot to. He, he gave me a lot of my discipline and stuff like that that would have allowed me to be able to then transition into the likes of mixed martial arts with John Kavanagh and the likes of Jimmy Upton, who taught me my boxing, and Mick Aldridge, who started me off in jiu-jitsu out in the Thai you know, all these guys, I, it's just, it, I think it's very important to, re to acknowledge and remember those people who helped you, you know? Fantastic. Brilliant. Brilliant. When, when so did what, does the, what, what does the future hold, Tom? What's the future plan for yourself? Huge is an interesting one. This whole COVID thing, you know, shook things up a little bit. 2020, I, I always, I thought maybe would have been the year where I would have opened up my own gym. Like I, I, the gym that I'm at now is my friend Kenny owns it, Kenny Kwan. Again, another man who I owe a lot to. Um, who gave me opportunities when I wanted to, you know, go out on my own. I was able to, you know, do my personal training there uh, at Trifecta MMA and run some of the programs and then take some of his fighters and help build them and everything like that. We've been doing some great stuff together. Um, but I always aspire to have my own gym that I run 100% how I want to run it. And um, 
I thought 2020 was going to be that year of being, you know, becoming a citizen, getting back into that competitive mindset, all this kind of stuff. And then obviously 2020 ended up being a bit of a shit show, as we all know. But, uh, but let's not get back into why, that. Why? Why? What happened? <laughs> <laughs> So I, I'm not, I, I, I'm going to wait until things are, I, I feel like I admire, I, I do know people who've opened businesses during this time and they've done certain things and, and they've managed them. And, and, but I, I feel like I want to wait a little bit more now until things are a little bit smoother. So I don't want to any bumps in the road. So when things are looking a little bit, a little bit, a little bit better, I'll, 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 um, I'll look to make certain moves, maybe on a, on a, on a business level, maybe opening a gym and, and doing things like that. And then obviously, oh, I, 100% wanting to compete again, uh, both in the likes of wrestling, jiu-jitsu. Um, and then, yeah, who knows? Like, you know, uh, you know, last year as well, everything that goes on, I definitely, you know, uh, the whole politics side of things definitely, int- you know, intrigued me a lot. And, and uh, you know, I was I was contemplating maybe maybe going to school and doing some, certain things when, you know, when it comes to law. Um, or, or political stuff, you know, I'm kind of contemplating certain things like that. So um, I don't know, there's a whole range of things, but definitely along the lines of opening a business, maybe going back to school to study, uh, you know, to kind of maybe prep myself for maybe doing some politics stuff in the future. I love the idea of maybe doing politics because now that I'm a citizen in the United States, the only qualification you need to run for office, whether it be uh, on the lower level, like on the city council level, mayor, governor, you know, you just can't, obviously, you can't run for president. That's right. I'll, raise my, I'll raise my son or my daughter to be the next president. president. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, for me, for me, uh, you know, I wasn't born here, so I can't become, I can't become president. But the only, the only thing you need, the only qualification you need to run for office is just to be a citizen. So, um, you know, it's not like they look at you and say, oh, how many college degrees do you have? Like, that helps. That helps, you know, you allow the public then to decide what you want. Or, or, or decide, you know, uh, you know, based on your arguments or your policies or your ideals, um, you, you can, it helps if, if you have, you know, qualifications, people might put their faith in you a little bit more to be a, a policymaker or, or a decision maker when it comes to certain things like this. But the only, the only qualification you need is to be a United States citizen. So now that I am a United States, United States citizen, and then given everything politically that's gone on over the last four years, which I feel like is politics has become a lot more mainstream. So naturally a lot of people are learning and, and, and maybe scratching their heads saying, well, hold on a second, maybe I could get involved here. And I admire the likes of Paddy Houlihan, like shout out to him. I talk to him on a regular basis. Yeah. Like we bounce ideas back and forth and he's incredible. Like, I and mean, then look at him, he ran for, for, uh, for the for, uh, council, 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 city council. councilor. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And like, he's doing some great work and his constituents love him. Um, and like you could argue that there's not a better guy in there than Paddy Hulan for doing what he does for his community. And, you know, not that I'm aware of that Paddy even went to college, but he's doing better than any of these other idiots that may have gone to college. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, uh, you know, but but to further back myself up, if I were to get into certain things, maybe I'm, I'm, I'm considering maybe studying some some forms of, um, you know, law and stuff like that. So give myself better understanding, better equipped if I were to run into into anything like that so i don't know there's a, there's a whole range of things that i'm looking at yeah. in the future you, you, that, that's very that's very interesting tom because i know i know you're 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 still a proud irish man but i can tell by by following you that you like you and america will do that to you, to you. it will pay patron it, it'll it'll turn you into a pa- patriot it really does when, when mm. you get entwined in the dream you're mm. you're all in or you're not in at all mm. and, and he's and he's really, really take, take, taken that you've taken that to heart yeah, and I feel like a lot, a lot of, a lot of Irishmen that come over here, what well, I should say, some Irishmen that come over here, you know, you kind of, you look at the, you look at certain things, and you know, you make the effort to come over, and you do certain things, and you start saying to yourself, you know, we have a history of that, the Irish people coming over here uh, and getting involved. I mean, we were the first to sometimes get involved in politics, run, run for office, and you had Irish politicians running area uh, uh, who were representing areas predominantly Jewish or Italian or, or, or whatever, you know, uh, because maybe it wasn't in their interest to do it. The Irish have always, something we've always done. And it's probably in the blood, uh, given the, everything that we've gone through uh, in our own country. Um, I mean, I, I have grandfathers on both sides of my family who volunteered uh, in, uh, after 1916, my great grandfather on my father's side, and then my mother's father, my mother's father would have been, roughly the same age as my father's grandfather 
So they would have actually, he, and he was more of a, he was a Leitrim man. And you know, Leitrim way back in those days was very, very heavily active with all that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and then obviously my, my great grandfather, so my, my father's grandfather would have been a Kildare man. And so they would have done, they, they volunteered between 1916 and 1922. And then my great grandfather stayed in, in the military. He stayed in the uh, army up until the fifties while my mother's father, uh, not so much he stayed in then he got out and, but uh, they, we, we've medals of both of theirs and uh so you know maybe it's in the blood a little bit always being interested being you know inquisitive about you know history the way things work and whatnot so but i, I noticed that even now too a lot of irish guys come over here and i get talking to them and it, it might be in our blood just as as you know as as, as folks who who knows what it's like as a history of 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 um uh, you know, having to kind of fight for what you what you exactly. believe in, you know, fight your own corner. Well, when when you were fighting there, Tom, like when you were an active fighter, let's put it that way, okay? So I know you're fighting all the time, anyway. But um, <laughs> you you're obviously cornering guys as well. Was that a simultaneous thing? Were you like cornering some of the guys that were in the gym while you were active fighter yourself, or did you kind of get in moving into the corner? as you were kind of slowing a few things out? Because I know that you cornered Connor a couple of times mm -hmm. in his early UFC stuff. He Was it the Max Holloway fight and the Dennis Seaver fight that you were... I, so it, was that an easy transition or were you were you doing it as you were fighting anyway? Um, yeah, well, with the McGregor stuff, I was still competing at the time. And then, you know, that was like a once-off thing here and there. If, you know, if he called me, I never called him. He would always call me. Mm. Um, to you know help him out or whatever i'd always either get a text or a call saying hey you know can you corner me um or be part of a training camp or whatever and so i kind of you know naturally i was like well this would be great experience for me as somebody who's eventually going to end up getting into the coaching world anyways and getting to you know do the cornering stuff alongside john cabin who's an absolute you know expert when it comes to that stuff just like Watching be, being around John and have, watching him corner the likes of you know Connor and other people like it was just it, you know John always had everything down to a T. He's a very very precise kind of guy when it comes to that stuff. So that was that was invaluable experience that I was able to take uh, and 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 uh, you know go on with and then use that then when I went to coach after the fact. So yeah, I would have there would have been a bit of time where I would have done the corner and stuff with McGregor competing myself and then. You know, obviously, when I went into more of a coaching role, more towards like 2016, 2017, um, I was able to take all that stuff and use use that experience. You know, mm. yeah, it's. Were you, like, were, were you in? You weren't in the corner for the Jose Aldo fight, were you, but were you in the camp? No, I was in the camp for the Mendez fight. It was supposed to be right. Aldo. Yes. So when when we when Connor was here in Boston for the uh, it was the World Tour that it was you know him and Jose Aldo that had the press conference here. Yeah, One yeah. of the stops was Boston when they were promoting the fight. And uh, so while while he was here, he said to me in person, he goes, "I want you to be part of my training camp. When you uh, we're gonna do like a ten week thing out in Vegas." So uh, I was out I was out there for that. Uh, but for the out by the time the Aldo fight came, I you know the Vegas thing was so long, and I did the Ultimate Fighter as well. And yes. It was, it would have been a lot to get then get back into the Aldo, uh, the Aldo thing, um, you know, especially, uh, yeah. I mean, like I said, taking a lot of time off from your own life, it can be tough, and uh, you know, you want to be compensating people correctly if you're going to have them uh, taking time away from their loved ones and their life. Of course, and like that. of course, yeah. of course you and, know. And, that, and that goes with 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 every every walk of life. Every walk yeah. of life, and and I, I don't think Connor quite grasped that concept of what you needed to do for people, you know. So at that time, the Aldo the Aldo camp thing was kind of something that I was happy not really being a part of, you know what I mean? So, um, but uh, yeah, so I wasn't part of that that camp. I was there. I was at the fight. I was at the <clears> fight. Like where were you shocked? Paradigm and Paradigm and um, Paradigm gave me a ticket. And uh, and then the U one of the UFC one of the companies who um, produced 
the Bad Blood show, which actually I was hired as a, as a producer to help when they went to Ireland, they hired me to go there and help them navigate through Dublin and where Connor would have grown up and everything like that. So I was a bit of a bit of a producer back in my day as well. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, um, yeah, no, I helped them with that. So they, they actually flew me out and then Paradigm gave me a ticket to the fight. And it was a lot of fun. Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, who wasn't that 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 knockout was almost divine. That was, I mean, it, was, it was almost like it was meant to happen, you know. Yeah, I that, swear to God, I got the horn when that happened. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah it was, that that was an outrageous night when, like, when he knocked him out in seven seconds. It was just mad, and it and it as you said, it was like meant to be. It was yeah, it was it was like perfectly like, scripted. It was almost like it was yeah, like I said, it was divine. It almost it felt divine. It felt like all right, this was meant to happen. You know, yeah. just given everything that had that had led up to it, it was meant to happen. You you mentioned the the Ultimate Fighter there when you were you were um one of the coaches on Connor's team when he was up against Uriah Faber, wasn't it? Um, what, right. what 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 was that like? Because Ashton Daly was saying she fucking hated every bloody second of being in the Ultimate Fighter, and we we we, we didn't we were like fucking surprised at that, but it's like producers make a nightmare of these type of shows anyway. They make it hard for you, like. Yeah, I mean, who the fuck wants to be just like, uh, you know, treated like an animal? You, you fight here and then you shut the fuck up there and you go here and you, you know what I mean? Like, not to be treated like an animal. I don't want to knock the UFC. I'm just saying just the nature of producing a show with yeah, fighters yeah. making weight and all that kind of stuff. It feels like that. Not that that's what they do. I'm not knocking the UFC. They do a phenomenal yeah. job. And the crew, the crew that I got to know personally behind the production, they are phenomenal. The things that they do, they're very, they cater to you top to bottom it's just the nature of being a fight i mean living your regular life cutting weight training making all this kind of stuff is hard enough let alone being in the same fucking house with a bunch of guys who you may or may not be fighting at any given moment you know on a day's notice you know what i mean so it's just it's just a stressful atmosphere and um i admire anybody that does go ahead and do it but not my favorite not my not my particular way of wanting to go about things in fact one of the times that mcgregor when when uh, before that Ultimate Fighter had kicked started, before they made it in all one fifty, wait, it was one seventy and one fifty five, I believe, were the weight classes, right? For that yeah. event, that Ultimate Fighter, wasn't it? Or was it one forty five? Because uh, no, Artem, Artem was in there, wasn't it? Was he? Uh, oh, it was fifty five and forty five. That's right. It was fifty five and forty five, I believe. Yeah, the, all the weight classes, and um, you know. Uh, they were initially, I think they were initially going to do 170 and they ended up not doing it. But uh, yeah, McGregor had asked me at one point if I wanted to do the Ultimate Fighter. If it had been at 170, he said he could get me in there. And I was just like, I was like, man, I, I can't even make 170 even if I wanted to right now because I've been increasingly getting a little bit, a little bit bigger over time. Like the last time I had fought was at 185 and I was already shredded at that. So like, I'm, number one, I'm not making 170. And I'm not living in a house. And then number two, I'm not fucking doing the other fighter. It's just not my style, you know? <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you know, so, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't have wanted to do the ultimate fighter either. Um, but, yeah, I'm not surprised that Ashton Daly hated every second of it. Oh, she, like, she really vehemently did not enjoy it. Yeah, like, who, who would enjoy that? I, you know? I, I, it's, yeah. it's funny because we, like, a friend of ours was on the Celebrity, celebrity Apprentice in Ireland. And... Oh. You know, filming stuff like that is long days and stressful. And, you know, like you'd think that it's only those reality TV shows are meant to create stress to try and create TV. So mm-hmm. when you do it with a That's bunch true. of fighters that are starving themselves anyway, yeah, like it's brilliant to watch. It's fucking right. great, great TV. But yeah. I can imagine being in there is fucking nightmare stuff. Nightmare. Like, nightmare. I don't, and I never thought of it like that until Ashley said it, to be honest, like. Yeah, I mean, you're not really comfortable, you know. I mean, listen, um, how many times have you gone on vacation with a bunch of your boys and three days into it, you're like, oh, I fucking hate all these cunts, get me out of here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like... Happened once or twice. <laughs> you know, you, you go on vacation with all your boys and you realize, uh, you know, you, you love each other when you're at home because you see each other spontaneously at the bar, but when you're spending all that time together, you're like, oh, this, this is a bit of a... You know, so imagine being in a house full of strangers... And who you may have to punch the shit out of them at some point, so it's weird. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it, 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 it is. A, it is a weird d- dynamic. Um, Tom, we probably won't keep you much, much, much longer. Um, Pete always asks a question. Do, do you want to go ahead? Go on. Yeah, I 
uh, I always ask this question. We have a lot of kids watching or young adults watching, and we have a, a segment called Agony's Uncle. And they text in if they have troubles or problems. But I always ask this question as well. If you have any advice to a young person that wants to get maybe into the UFC, wants to go to America, wants to start up their own business, what advice would you give to somebody maybe wants to get into the UFC? What advice would you give them? Um, I know it sounds cliche, but you really got to believe in yourself. If you're going to do something, it really is the, the recipe for a lot of things. If you, you really got to believe that that is what you want to do. Um, you know, you got to put your best foot forward and everything. You got to be honest, genuine with your approach to people. How you treat others is ultimately how you're going to be treated. Um, so having a good attitude uh, and, and more than most of all, putting the work in. If you put the work in, it oftentimes comes back. Um, so belief, uh, you know, being a good person, having a good attitude especially when it comes to other people and hard work. There are three things that I'd say are, are a good recipe for success. Now it's, it sounds hard sometimes and I get it. It sounds hard sometimes to, to, to think, how do I do that? But oftentimes when you, when you really just focus on, on, on three things like that, you, you start to realize, Oh, wow, it's actually working. It's actually working. I am putting my hard work in, I'm getting results. I'm having a good attitude. People are giving me opportunities. Um, and I'm believing in myself. Therefore, what I'm doing, the, the, whether it be the product that I'm selling or the product I'm trying to develop or you being yourself, the product itself, you start to say to yourself, I'm having results here. So belief, hard work and having a good attitude, I think are, are huge key things. Um, and it might, it might sound funky in the beginning, but if you put your head down and go for it, you'll start to see those results, you know? I think we can all agree that that will create success in anything. You want to do yeah and, and, and like hold yourself accountable hold yourself be, be self-accountable a lot of people are not not self-accountable they, they like to put the blame in different areas and ulti true, ultimately yeah. ultimately in this world where we are now you know holding yourself accountable again i believe that kind of falls into the category of having a good attitude if you have a good attitude yeah. towards things you're you're, you're less likely to want to put the blame on other people hold yourself accountable for a lot of things too as Pete uh, would say, you're, you're the captain of your own ship. Absolutely. And yeah. and if you happen to, you know, again, being going back to what you're saying, the captain of your own ship, holding yourself accountable. If I get involved with somebody and I put my trust in them and they betray my trust and they fuck me over and I end up having a difficult time, well, it was on me for putting my trust in them in the first place. Mm -hmm. And what can I do from that? All I can do is learn from it. But I got to hold myself accountable knowing that it was me that put myself in that position, which led to that being a certain way. And I just got to learn from that now. And I think learning from mistakes is very key as well. You can't dwell on your mistakes, you know. Um, you have to you have to get up and keep going. Um, and I tell that to my guys in the fight game. When they're fighting, I'm like, I'm like, when you're in the middle of a fight, don't admire your good work and don't dwell on your mistakes. Because either one of those things can sometimes get you messed up. If you, if you admire your work, you might take a second and realize, geez, that was a nice move. And, uh, and next thing you know, they're coming back, they're fighting harder and you might get clipped. Uh, or, but if you dwell on your mistakes, so you say, oh shit, fucking, I shouldn't have done that. Your, your morale starts to come down. So you got to stay consistent, you know? Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. brilliant. Vice brilliant. I also want to say that when, when you were on about, when I mentioned that you should be proud about what you've achieved um, in, in the UFC and, and in life, um, and that you don't go around shouting about it, or you don't go around. I'm the first Irish UFC fighter. It reminded me of one of my one of my my favorite saying is a, a line will never have to tell you it's a line. All oh, right, right. I like that. Yeah, yeah that's a good one. So, yeah. Um, I just wanted to, I just wanted to get that in because it just reminded me of that, and I, I wrote I it down. That. I, I don't I don't usually write things down, but I wanted to I wanted to get it in. I like that. A line doesn't have to say that it's a line or tell a, people. A, li a, li a line will never have to tell you he's a line. Okay. A line will never. I'm going to have to have you message me that or text me that. I will. I, will. I don't want to mess it up. I don't want to mess that up. Yeah, perfect. I'll actually, yeah, I'll send it on to you. Yeah. No problem. Send it on to me on, on Instagram or something. I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll get a look at it. Tom, Tom we'll, have to, we'll all have to hang out in Brilliant. Boston soon enough. Yeah. Oh, listen, if you're ever, when, when things are back to normal or, you know, God willing, things get back to normal. 
I'd love to have you over here and we'll go out for a few pints and we'll shoot the shit and we'll do whatever. Yeah, yeah. 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 That would be or, or, or even or even likewise if I end up back home, if things get better and if I end up back home and things are open, we should all go for one as well. Yeah, you know? yeah. Way, if we, definitely. Love if that. we see if we see you're on the way back or, or vice versa, if we're on the way over, we'll definitely um we'll oh, hang we'll out definitely make contact. Back. Where are you all based now, if you don't mind me asking? Uh we're, we're all from I'm, I'm in I'm in Leitrim. I'm in Leitrim at the minute. So great place. Yeah. I love Leitrim. Yeah, yeah I'm in Leitrim. Yeah, yeah, I, I yeah I'm from Mayo. I, I split half my time in Dublin, half my time in Mayo. So I'm up in Dublin for work, very but good. I go home at the weekends, you know. Very good, very good. Uh, get and and, um, Mayo. I'm at the foot of the reek. I'm literally, I could throw a stone at the reek here. Yeah, you're in okay. where? Uh, Westport. I could throw a stone at the reek and I could throw oh. a sh- st- uh, between the sea and the mountain. So it's just a beautiful spot. That. Yeah, that's brilliant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's cool, man. So, Tom, that, that, that's it. Thank you very much for coming on. Guys, uh, thank you for listening to this podcast. I really enjoyed it. Um, Tom, where, where can we find you? What, what platforms are you on? Uh, well, I'm on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Uh, Twitter and Instagram, same handle. It's at Team Egan MMA. Um, if you search my name, Tom Egan, it usually pops up, but at Team Egan MMA. Um, and then I'm on Facebook as Tom Egan. Um, so, yeah, you can shoot me a friend request or or follow me on there and, and yeah I'm happy to I, I love I love conversating and this uh, and talking to people I try to try to get back to people if they reach out and yeah brilliant Tom brilliant. 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 Tom thanks very much for coming on you're a legend sound thanks boys yeah appreciate it all right. all right all right guys uh thank you so much for watching uh, as I just said and if you're on YouTube please hit the red tab and subscribe to the channel and also if you'd like to become a patron member Uh, It would mean so much to us. It would mean that we're able to keep doing podcasts and having class guests on like Tom here. And uh, also we have a a couple of surprises coming up very soon for our Patreon members. Tom, that's it. Good night. And thank you very much for being with us. Good meal, Margie.